Well, good morning, C2 Church. He is risen. That's right. I'm just going to keep it going this morning. I'm Pastor Jeremy. I'm so glad that you are with us this morning, whether it's your first time or your millionth time. I personally am so glad to see each and every one of you here this morning as we enter into the Easter story. We've been in a series called The Jesus Story, and if you haven't been with us, no big deal. This is a great time to to be with us. It's a great uh, time for you to join us in this series. If you are curious after this morning's message, you can get the rest of the series online at C2Church. Dot com. And can I just say thank you for your generosity, both in your regular giving that helps us operate on a day-to-day basis reaching our city, but for your above and beyond giving through Kingdom Builders. And as Pastor Matt said, one of the projects that we commit to every year is scholarshiping our young people to go on mission around the world. Uh, usually tell El Salvador, but not exclusively. And so many of our high school students are receiving scholarships that you have provided. It provides a way for them to get to uh, El Salvador. It's usually a couple thousand dollars to go, and your generosity is helping them get there. And it also shows them that you believe in them, that you love them. And so I'm so grateful. We've already had a chance to scholarship many of our college students through Chi Alpha as they've traveled the globe literally this spring and spring break trips. Your generosity has helped scholarship many of them to go on their missions all around the world. So I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you from the bottom of my heart and thank you for joining Darcy and I in giving this Easter. You know, Easter is about an empty tomb and a promise. Amen, Pastor. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's about an empty tomb and a promise. That's what we have is an empty tomb and a promise. Easter is about resurrection. It's, it's about the self-living, self-giving, self-sacrificial love of God the Father. And Easter is about new beginnings. It's about second chances. It's about the beginning of the story, not the end of the story. Some look at at Easter and they think it's the end of the story. Well, we know Christmas, Jesus comes. That's the beginning of the story. But we all know that that's not really the beginning of the story. You got to go all the way back in time when God created. But the story of Jesus for us starts at Christmas and then Easter has to be the end of the story, right? (laughs) Friend, Easter is not the end of the story. It really just starts to get good at Easter with the resurrection. For many of us if in cultural Western Christianity, if we think Easter is the end, our culture be- begins to believe Easter is all there is. And we've developed a faith around the end of the story. But there's more to the story. The story of the empty tomb is also the story of a promise. Easter is about belief and declaration. Easter is about seeking and seeing the risen Jesus. Throughout our study of the book, uh, the Gospel of Mark, I've said something like this. The story I tell myself about Jesus is the Jesus I tend to see. If I don't believe Jesus really has an effect on my life or could change my life or free me from the addictions... And the bondages and the hurts that I have in my life, I will never see that Jesus. If I believe Jesus is just judgmental, as are his followers, that's all I'll see. That's all I see is is the judgment instead of the mercy and the grace. But maybe this morning you'll receive a challenge from me. That maybe you need to seek him differently and then you'll see him differently that you'll discover of truth that you haven't discovered about Jesus. When we're reading through and studying the gospel of Mark, I want to remind you that the gospels are the recording of this good news about the life and teaching of Jesus. And the gospel are meant to convince us that Jesus is the risen Messiah, the true king of the world, and we should follow him. And so the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John record for us Jesus born as a human, 
through the Virgin Mary. He suffered he, and he was tempted as a human. He declares the kingdom of God is near and that we should repent and turn back to God's way. And that's the way into God's kingdom, that we should stop being a rebel and come and do things God's way, his way of love. And Jesus, throughout the book of Mark, we've discovered, goes about preaching repentance and performing signs and wonders, miracles and healings. It's as if he's taking the power of the kingdom that is to come and he's bringing and ushering it into the moment. The moment that his compassion meets with a need, there's a miracle, there's a healing. Jesus doesn't do miracles on demand, nor does he do them to prove himself. He does them to demonstrate the loving compassion and kindness of God the Father and his kingdom. But then in every gospel, there's a great plot twist, the greatest plot twist in all of history. The expected savior, Messiah, the seemingly conquering king is executed on a cross and is buried. And that's not the end of the story. What we'll discover this morning is meaning beyond the cross and into the empty tomb. Common consensus holds that the gospel of Mark was actually the first gospel written. And Mark was the the first to embark on this epic task of recording, chronicling the teachings and deeds of Jesus. But Mark has a peculiar ending. Have any of you read the ending of Mark yet? If not, we're going to dive into it this morning. It has a peculiar feature that we don't often talk about. The ending of Mark is kind of jarring and dissatisfying, if you will. What's going on with the ending of Mark? Well, let's read. Mark chapter 16, starting in verse 1. Mark 16, Saturday evening, when the Sabbath had ended, Mary Magdalene, mother, Mary the mother of James, and Salome went out and purchased burial spices so, so they could anoint Jesus' body. At this point, Jesus is already buried in the tomb. Very early on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, they went to the tomb. On the way there, they were asking each other, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? But as they arrived, they looked up and saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled aside. When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side. The women were shocked. But the angel said, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He isn't here, exclamation point. He is risen from the dead, exclamation point. Look, this is where they laid his body. Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there, just as he told you before he died. The women fled from the tomb, trembling and bewildered, and they said nothing to anyone because they were too frightened. Now read, in my Bible, it has a little... uh, denotation. The most ancient manuscripts of Mark conclude with verse 8. Later manuscripts add one or both of the following endings. Well, what do I do with that? (laughs) Can I be honest with you? Or do you want me to lie to you? Which one? (laughs) Right? When people say that, you're always wondering. I will be honest with you. I try to avoid preaching the Easter story from Mark's perspective. Because for a long time, I didn't know what to do with that ending. What do I do with this big question mark? The most reliable, ancient, uh, older manuscripts don't have the last part or parts. How do I explain that to a skeptical person that the gospel has additions after the original manuscripts? What in the world do I do with that? Anybody ever wonder that? I hope so. I actually think over the course of the 
last month or so as I've been preparing for this morning, Mark's ending actually has become my favorite. (laughs) And I'll tell you why. I find Mark's ending actually more believable. I find that the addition of the the later, uh, latter pieces of it help me understand that what Mark may have intended, others took and passed along and went, Mark must have forgot something. <laughs> he got busy and he forgot to end his story. And so we're going we're gonna to help Mark, the scribe, say. Now, this is the longest scribal edition in all of, uh, in all of the New Testament. And they know. They know it's added. That's, that's actually why I like it. Because every one of our Bibles has these little notes that say, hey, we just want to let you know that this is, this is what we have in all of the manuscripts. You understand that the New Testament and the Gospels have more ancient manuscripts than any ancient manuscript, more than Shakespeare, right? So the Gospels are believable in themselves simply because of the sheer number of manuscripts that we have that are very, very close to each other with just minor discrepancies. So that's why I think the Gospels in general are believable. But Mark sort of says to me, I can trust those who translated and put this uh, together because they, they wanted to tell me that there were some discrepancies, right? Now, if you're writing legend and myth, you don't take time to go, you know, we should probably tell people we're just making this up as we go. We should leave all that out. We should perfect the story. Again, that's why I think the Gospels are believable. Because when you read the addition, uh, the additional endings, they're not stuff of myth or fable or, or legend. Why? <laughs> if you read it, it makes the disciples look mm, not good. Because if I'm one of the disciples, I'm saying to the people uh, writing this, Uh, Could you just leave that out? Would you put in that I did believe when everybody else was doubting that I was the one who was like, no, guys, we should believe this. Could you just change change it a little bit, make me look good? There's none of that. The disciples don't look good in most of the Gospels. They have their moments, like all of us, I guess. But their journey is more about doubt and stupidity sometimes than it is about belief And really stepping into what Jesus was teaching. So that's why I like Mark. I like that if you read it to Mark's original ending, it kind of is like a cliffhanger. How many of you like those episodes of your favorite TV show that it's a two-parter in the olden days? Before you could like record stuff or had Netflix and just binge watch stuff, you had to wait seven days for part two, or if it was the end of the season, you had to wait months. How, I don't know how we survived. <laughs> but I like a good cliffhanger. I, I, I like that Mark's gospel just kind of leaves us hanging out there. And I like that the scribes, they include the discrepancies. They don't hide them. They don't overlook them. They don't blend it in. They write the notes to say, hey, by the way, we're just letting you know, here's, here's what we know about the manuscripts. I know many people say, well, I, I object to the Gospels because they're written by humans. So is your nightly news and your social media. And you believe them without question, some of you. Hmm. All of history was written by humans. Go figure. Someone had to pen what happened. Someone had to write it down. So to simply declare something as unbelievable because, well, humans wrote it, well, that doesn't make any sense. The objection is that, well, the disciples had a bias and an agenda. I don't know any human who doesn't. But they had a story. And they had the truth. And they lived it. And from an archaeological perspective, it's believable because they wrote it within a time frame that's acceptable for literary archaeology. So what about this ending? I kind of like the the extra ending because it's the happy ending. (laughs) 
right? It's like, oh, let's wrap this up. We put a bow on it. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what the scribes were like, we got to fix this ending with Mark. Let's just take some pieces. I think they took stuff from like Luke and probably some other sources, and they just sort of put them together, the best pieces, throw the Great Commission in there, signs and wonders, the disciples don't believe, they're kind of still stupid, put that all in there, and then we'll just wrap it up. Happy ending. Jesus is resurrected, they see him, he ascends into heaven, he leaves the Great Commission. Yeah, that's good. That's all we need. But that's not necessarily what they did, although they did add probably for harmony with the other gospels. But what do we do with this? What if Mark's ending was actually intentional? He was intentionally ambiguous? Yeah. What if he was intentional? Let's look at chapter 16. Let's just walk through it, shall we? Chapter 16 reveals this. An empty tomb with an angelic appearance, an angelic announcement, an angelic command, and a divine promise. Here's a couple of things we're going to walk through real quick. If you want to write them down, you can write them down. They'll be up on, your, on the screen. There's the moment of discovery, right? The tomb is empty. There's a wind in here. I think it's the Holy Spirit because my page just keeps turning. There's a moment of discovery when they walk into the empty tomb. I've been to the empty tomb. The traditional site where Jesus was buried. Was it actually where Jesus is buried? It's hard to say. He was resurrected, so there was no need necessarily to reserve it. I read a meme this weekend that I thought was terrific. Can I share it with you? I wish I would have put it up on the screen. Pilate asked Joseph when Joseph of Arimathea came to Pilate to say, hey, can I take the body of Jesus and bury it in my tomb? And Pilate says, you bought this very expensive tomb, but now you're just going to give it to this Jesus character? And Joseph of Arimathea says, it's only for the weekend. <laughs> I, I wish I would have wrote that. I should have just claimed it. I should have just not even told you. It's just for the weekend. This is what we know. They, they, there's a three-foot entrance. They have to duck to get in. It's dark. Maybe they have a little bit of a lantern or something, and they come in. There's a little bit of a step down. There's a bench where they may have laid the body. As they peer in, they can't see anything. <gasps> Someone's sitting there. <laughs> They're a little scared. Right? But we have this empty tomb. We have an angel. No Jesus. That should raise our curiosity. If Jesus isn't there, where is he? I wish I had time to go through all of the logical things that could have happened that would lead us to believe the true story of the Gospels. They're out there. You can go study them for yourself. We know there's a moment of discovery. Then there's a moment of proclamation. He is risen! Exclamation point! How, when you read that, what does it sound like in your head? Go ahead and say it to me. You're like the worst storytellers ever. <laughs> uh, he is risen. How about he is risen! I had a little coffee this morning. <laughs> Full strength, too. I, th I think the angel was just as excited. I think the angel was like, I get to be the first one to say it out loud. <laughs> he is risen! He's not here. He actually makes two exclamations. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Look, this is where we laid his body. Ta-da, he's not here. It's a moment of proclamation. Moment of proclamation. It leads to a moment of direction. A moment of direction. Go and tell his disciples. Jesus is going ahead of you into Galilee. Go and tell. You cannot read the Gospels even once without seeing the instructions to go and tell. Every Christian should internalize that command, go and tell. Do you remember 
in, in grade school, when you got to bring something to class, what did you call that? Yeah. Can you imagine if every Christian internalized this idea that every day I get to show and tell, I get to go and tell? So this is their direction. This is a, a moment of direction from the angels. You see, the women disciples are the first witnesses of the resurrection, and they are the first custodians of this good news of resurrection. And that moment of direction leads to a moment of promise. You will see him. You will see him. If you put yourself in the place of those women that morning, having just endured the trauma of having watched Jesus being brutally beaten and tortured, to see him carry that cross beam up the Via Della Rosa, all the way up to Calvary, Golgotha, the place of the skull, to see him nailed to that cross along with two rebels, and then to see him die. Could we maybe have some grace for the women? They're probably suffering from a little bit of PTSD. For real. Cognitive dissonance. Jesus was dead, and now the angel's telling me he's alive. What do I do with that? I mean, what kind of thoughts are going through their head? What kind of emotions are welling up inside of them? Can you just imagine what that moment was like for them? The angel in all of his, I want to say boyish exuberance, he is risen. He's not here. He's risen just like he said he would. And then he delivers that promise, go and you will see him. I will see him? but he's dead. What do I do with that? What do I do with the promise? I will see him. And here, here's the greater promise. You will see him if you believe he's alive and obey the command to seek him. Simply put, if you seek Jesus, you will see him. I wonder sometimes, those of you who may not be followers of Jesus, that One, you believe wrong things about Jesus. You believed things that are not accurate about Jesus. That is the greatest ringtone ever, (laughs) whatever that is. I need to get that ringtone. If you seek Jesus, you will see Jesus. That's, That's a great promise, that if we seek him, we will see him. And I think sometimes we have this narrow view of who Jesus is, especially if you don't believe, and you you take what culture tells us about Jesus and his followers. And instead of actually experiencing Jesus for yourself, you take perceptions about him and stereotypes about him. That may not be true. There's a moment of promise here that I hope we all enter into, that if you seek him, you will see him. But then it seems that Mark intentionally concludes with verse eight, where it says, the women fled from the tomb, trembling and bewildered. And they said nothing to anyone because they were too frightened. Huh. Mark, you're confusing. You spend spend all this time leading us up to this moment because you've been declaring Jesus the Messiah, the signs and wonders and the stories all the way up only to tell us the women fail and disobey. He kind of leaves us, this is act three, by the way, in Mark's writings. If we look at the first two acts uh, of his writing, if you would, if it was a play, probably one, uh, chapters one through seven are act one, eight through 
13 or about Act 2, maybe 12. But each of those acts ends with the disciples disbelieving, doubting, and full of fear. Hey, can I just say, I can identify with that? Can any of you identify with that? I certainly can. So what is Mark doing with an ending like this? The story ends without closure, forcing us to grapple with the strange and scandalous claim that Jesus is risen, that they could go and meet him if they seek him out in the Galilee, but they don't. Mark, you're not doing a great job of convincing me of your gospel. You give me a gripping tale of Jesus' life, we arrive at the end, and then you kind of leave a bunch of stuff out. If this is all I had, I would kind of go, what? What do I do? You have to ask yourself, too, like, why did Mark include women who, in this moment, were culturally less credible witnesses than men? Why are they the first recipients and guardians of the gospel? Why didn't he include the sighting of Jesus to prove he had risen from the dead? Do you think he might have thought of that? That's a big part of it. Why doesn't he include the obvious why does he include the obvious human failure of the women's fear and their disobedience in response to the gospel? Was he just forgetful? But what if we ask ourselves another question? What if we ask ourselves to reconsider Mark's ending? That it was intentional, compelling us to discover the risen Jesus ourselves. What if it's not just intentional, but it was an invitation? What if Mark leaves it there for us to go on the journey to find the risen Jesus? See, I think Mark invites us into participation through four ways. He invites us into participation in his gospel through belief, declaration, seeking, and seeing. He invites us into participation through belief. In all the gospels and in the longer ending of Mark, Jesus chastises the disciples over and over again for their lack of belief, right? If you read the longer ending and if you take into account the other gospels uh, as well as uh, earlier in Mark, the, the disciples fail to understand Jesus, his mission, who he is, his true identity. They don't understand and they don't believe And then they didn't believe the women who we do find out, we do know from history that they do end up telling the disciples. We understand that. We understand that they may have failed at first, but they succeeded in sharing the gospel with the male disciples. But these disciples didn't believe the women. They didn't believe when the tomb was empty. They didn't believe when two disciples who had been walking on the road to Emmaus and Jesus appears to them, they came back and said, we saw the risen Jesus. And the disciples were like, yeah, I don't think so. They continued their disbelief. Even Thomas didn't believe until he touched Jesus's hands and sighed. And Mark invites us to discover what Jesus was teaching Seeing is not believing. Believing is seeing. If you ever watch the Santa Claus, it's in there too. So I just, that's like proof that this is true. I think it's a shame that many people will say, I will believe in Jesus when I see. But you won't see, because you can't see. You You've become blind and you can't see. So what if you chose to believe first? Friend, I promise you this. If you believe, you will see. You will see. You will see. There's something about the human psyche. When we don't believe, we don't see. I have to share this story about my wife from yesterday because I tell this story about myself all the time, which is totally true. And this is, honey, this is the only time I can remember this happening to you. She she said, you know what I'm talking about. She knows what I'm talking about. (laughs) In our marriage, I can't think of one time where she has ever gone to the cabinet and couldn't, or the refrigerator, and couldn't find something. 
I, however, when she says, go, find the, go get the peanut butter, I'll be like, I can't. Where, I, where, where is it? It's not where it's supposed to be. It's not. And so I tell her, peanut butter's missing. Someone came into the house, <laughs> stole the peanut butter. It's just not there. What does she do? She walks over the cabinet. She opens it. And where is it? Right there. It's not in its spot. It's one shelf down. Clearly, I have a valid excuse for not seeing it. <laughs> this happened to her yesterday. She said, honey, um, I, th- I think she's at her, her exact words were most handsome man. Um, <laughs> that, that's beside the point. Um, she said, um, I think it was whipped cream for today. We have whip- I love whipped cream. Any of you would just eat whipped cream by itself? I'll, you're all my favorite. Okay, sorry. Squirrel. Okay, let's get back. So she says, did, where did you put it? And I said, it's in the refrigerator. She says, no, it's not. I said, well, that's where I put it. Well, I didn't, it's not in there. And I said, I didn't say this, but this is what I'm thinking. The same person who stole the peanut butter <laughs> took the whipped cream. I opened the refrigerator door, and can I just tell you, a wave of satisfaction just <laughs> rolled over me. Because honestly, I was thinking, well, where did I put it? I swear I put it in the refrigerator. Maybe I put it outside. One time I took a whole box of frozen food, set it on the outside chest freezer, thinking to myself later, I will go put it in the freezer later. The next day I come out and go, oh. I just tend to forget things, right? Can I tell you, Zach, I just felt so satisfied. It was right there. Where I put it, it was right there. But she couldn't see it. I don't know why. (laughs) She may just be messing with me. I don't know. But friend, if you believe, you will see. You will, when you seek Jesus, you will see him. And Mark invites us not only into belief, but declaration. Listen to what the apostle Paul says in Romans 10, 9. If you openly declare, everybody say declare, that Jesus is Lord and believe, everyone say believe, Believe. in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There is a truth about declaration in your life. When you declare something to be true, your heart will follow it. The whole world will be colored, shaded, and filtered by that belief. If Jesus isn't who he says he is and who Christians claim him to be, and you believe that, you will never see Jesus. He will just be the fairy tale and fable you've been told. When Paul says that if you declare openly, some translations say with your mouth, that there's an actual supernatural uh, transaction that happens when you declare with your mouth and your ears hear you say it out loud. You believe in your heart. What is this heart? What is, is, is that, what, what is the gospel trying to say when it says believe in your heart? In the ancient Hebrew context, the heart was the center of thought, will, identity, and emotion. How you act, think, identify, and feel all comes from the center of who you are, your heart. And if it's focused on declaring Jesus, the truth that he's resurrected and his life-giving love has entered into my life, the king of the world has come into my life and I submit my life to him, it says you will be saved. And if you're not careful, you'll fall into the trap that salvation is just about, well, when I die, I won't go to hell. I mean, that's kind of good news, but that's kind of mediocre news. There's a greater truth to salvation. What does it mean to be saved? It's about a life that comes into you, into your dead spirit. The life of Jesus comes into you and resurrects you here and now, not just when your physical body dies. Some of you have had life-transforming moments with Jesus, where before Jesus, you were dead 
And in your sin, buried in your sin, the tomb was closed on you. You were caught in addiction and heartbreak and pain. And then something happened when Jesus came in, when you surrendered your life to him. That moment, you experienced resurrecting power. You see, you're not just saved from hell or saved from something, but here's an incredible truth, friend. You're saved to something. You're not just saved from sin and shame and condemnation. You're saved from purposelessness and wandering and striving in this life, but you're saved into a life-giving relationship, chosen and adopted, brought into the family, fully loved, fully known, fully accepted. That's the truth about the saving power of Jesus. In fact, in John's gospel, He writes, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were not, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. And Mark moves beyond belief and declaration into seeking. The angelic direction to the women is applicable to us still today to seek Jesus, to seek the risen king. The promise of the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 29, he says, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. And when you seek, this is where Mark leads us to participate in seeing Jesus. Mark firmly tells us Jesus reigns as king of the world even even if his disciples don't believe it yet. When verse eight ends, we don't know what the disciples are going to do. If you just remain in the story of Mark and you don't consider the rest of the gospel stories, we know that Mark has made it clear that Jesus is the risen king of the world, whether anybody else declared it or not. That's the thing about truth. It can be true whether you believe it or not. It's true and the truth doesn't care what you think or feel or what the news tells you. It's true. And Mark makes it clear. And so does the angel. You will see him if you believe is alive and you obey the command to seek him. And if you seek Jesus, friend, you will see Jesus. You will experience and know Jesus. And so the last moment I want to share with you is a moment of decision. You see The women at first are driven by fear, not faith, by doubt. And the moment of decision for them was when they left that tomb and they didn't tell anybody at first. The gospels sort of record it differently. And this is, again, why I think the gospels are believable. Because four different viewpoints of what happened. And somewhere in all of this, we get this picture that they did tell somebody. Well, how do we know if they told somebody? We're sitting here today. That's how we know. That's how we know. The readers of Mark, the original readers of Mark, would have understood that those women told somebody because they were sitting there reading Mark's gospel. They knew the ending, like we do. But there's a moment of decision that I think all of us should enter into today. Will we doubt and run away like the disciples or will we recognize the crucified and risen Jesus as king? Will we go forth and tell the good news of what Christ has done for us, that there's resurrection power in a dying world? You know, Mark's gospel actually invites us to write the ending. Isn't that awesome? You know, when we first started studying the book of Mark, the first chapter, Mark tells us this is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. He never says this is the ending of the good news. And that's why I actually think Mark's original ending or the shorter ending is actually it's original. I, I want to believe that Mark 
said, I want people to enter in, to participate, to experience, and to write the ending of the gospel. If your life was the writing of the end of that gospel, what would that proclaim? What would it tell people? That you sought out and you saw and you experienced the risen King Jesus or you ran away in fear because you're afraid of what people might think. That your God raised from the dead. I'm telling you, that actually isn't the craziest uh, claim about what a God can do. I said earlier today, everybody's following these gods that promise to do them something, at least in their mind, their God's going to do something for them. Well, the God of alcohol is going to help me with all my problems. You know, in 20 plus years of pastoring, I've never had someone say, Jeremy, I I just wanted to share with you that when I gave my life to alcohol, my life just, just, everything just fell into place. Right? And some of you know how ridiculous that sounds, but there are people who chase the gods like that. I'm telling you, it's not ridiculous to believe that the self-giving, self-sacrificial love of King Jesus, when he died and rose again, it's not the most ridiculous claim ever. Actually kind of tame compared. What, what ending to the gospel Will your life declare that King Jesus is who he said he is? He really did rise from the dead and that resurrection power is for me or it was only a story. I think the only obvious response to this message then and now should be to set off on a journey of discovery to meet the risen King Jesus. And my hope for you today If you feel far from Jesus, you're actually closer than you think. Because he's closer than you think. Jesus is part ninja. He's there and you don't know it yet. So friend, my hope for you today is that you would surrender your life. And maybe it's just the pieces and the brokenness we just give that to Jesus today and see what he might do for those of you who are already followers of Jesus Easter is a day of celebration maybe today your challenge is to seek Jesus more experience him more and be the one who goes and tells everyone around you would you stand with me as we close together I want to give you that opportunity if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus this morning and you're saying, Pastor Jeremy, I want my story to be included in the gospel story. You see, I think the gospel ends when King Jesus returns and he sets everything right. You know, we all want things set right. There's a sense of justice, how things ought to be. And one day, they will be as they ought to be when King Jesus returns. And I believe the gospel story will conclude as all of the saints gather around the throne and all of our stories point to King Jesus, King of the universe. But maybe this morning you're saying, Pastor Jeremy, I want to be included in that story. I want to accept Jesus into my life and let him lead my life. I want to repent from my own way as a rebel. And I want to do things his way. If you need to know, even if you don't know what that all means today, today is just the start of the journey of seeking and seeing Jesus. I'm just going to invite everybody to close their eyes and bow their heads in this holy moment. This is an eternal moment for several of you in this room today and maybe even online, friend. If you're saying that's me and you're online this morning, would you just put it in the chat? Would you private message our team, our host would love to pray with you this morning. But if that's you, you're saying, Pastor Jeremy, count me in. In a second, I'm going to count to three, and I'm going to ask you to lift your hand. Be bold. No one else is looking around. This isn't, a, this isn't a moment to embarrass you. It's simply a moment for you to acknowledge where you're at. And all around this room, hands are going to go up. 
And then after that, the whole church, those who've already made Jesus the Lord of our lives, we're gonna pray with you, right? So you're not alone. You're, in a, you're probably in the safest place you could ever be to make that decision and declare that today. So when I count to three, would you be bold, courageous? Would you raise your hand when I count to three? One, Jesus lived the perfect life. Two, he suffered in your place. He died and he rose again. Three, would you lift your hands up all over this room? All over this room. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I see you in the back. Anybody else? Thank you over here. I see you. Thank you. Anybody else? I'm looking over here on the left. You're right. In the middle. Thank you. I see you. I'm looking on your left, my right. Anybody else? Then church, let's pray together with all those who raised their hands this morning, that prayer of faith. And maybe for those of you who prayed before, it'll be a renewal of your faith to seek and see Jesus. Would you say this prayer out loud with all those who lifted their hands this morning? Say, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me so much that you sent your son Jesus to live the perfect life that I could not live. He suffered in my place and he died to pay my sin debt. I ask for your forgiveness. I thank you that Jesus rose from the dead. And because of that, I receive new life today. Give me your Holy Spirit to follow after you, Jesus. It's in the name of Jesus, pray. Now, Father, would you bless your people? Would you help us see and seek you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength? May we be the carriers of the gospel of resurrection life to everyone who will hear. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.